Salutations everybody, it is Matty here, and today we are going to be digging into Sony's most underappreciated piece of hardware, the PS Vita. But before we do dive in, a quick introduction to those who may not know me since you know, I'm new around these parts. I run a YouTube channel called Mr. Matty Plays. Over there you can find me talking about role playing games almost every day, yelling about Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic in some form or fashion. I also like long walks on the- wait, this is starting to sound like a dating site. Let's just get into the Vita. The main question we will be answering today is if the PlayStation Vita is worth your hard-earned money in 2020. This is in a year where we have a new generation of consoles coming in, the Switch booming, and Analog releasing what is essentially a modern Game Boy. The competition is steep and money could certainly be saved for any of these potential purchases and then some. To deduce the value of the console, we'll be taking a peek at the specs of the system itself, of course, but also its library of games and analyzing its life cycle. It starts in June of 2011 when Sony had announced that the PSP had surpassed 70 million units sold. Naturally, a successor had to be on the way. Alongside that statistic, Sony announced the PlayStation Vita. The Vita was to come packed with a vibrant 5-inch OLED screen that made colors pop a touchscreen, a back touchpad, as well as the ability to deliver console quality games on the go. It also had its own form of cartridges, getting rid of the UMDs from the PSP. While great at face value, the Vita also had a few things holding it back, one in particular to consider during your potential purchase. It had 3G functionality, and based off what PlayStation had written on their blog, mentioning the likes of communicating with friends via party chat or texts, playing games and accessing the likes of Twitter and Facebook, they sort of wanted to replace your phone. Ultimately, this functionality was found to be completely useless. Every time I turn my back, you're fooling around on those damn phones, checking your life journals and your my places. The other component suppressing the Vita's success was Sony's decision to make a totally separate memory card. Four and eight gigabyte memory cards were the only remotely affordable ones. However, they hardly held any games or demos before you had to clear out some space to download something else onto it. On the other end of the spectrum, we had the 16 to 32 gigabyte range of memory cards, but these cards were and still are outrageously overpriced when compared to SanDisk's micro SD cards with the same amount of memory. So while the system nowadays is affordable, you'll be spending about the same price as a game on your Vita just to have a decent memory card for it. Nowadays, you can acquire the PS Vita system itself with a charger for roughly 100 to $120 off of eBay. GameStop also sells both the slim model as well as the original PS Vita for roughly $130. My personal recommendation would be to aim to acquire the original PS Vita because the slim swaps out the beautiful OLED screen for an LCD one. Plus, the original Vita has this heft to it, whereas the slim feels like it'll snap in your hands if you're anything less than delicate with it. Fly! Come in! Sly! Do you read me? Yeah, I read you. Loud and very loud. All right, now that you know a little bit about the console itself, let's take a look at the Vita's library of games. You see, the selection of titles here are excellent, but there's a snag we're gonna get into. There are high fidelity titles delivering on that console quality that Sony had promised, like Uncharted Golden Abyss and Killzone Mercenary that are still stranded on the PS Vita. Uncharted Golden Abyss really showed how strong the Vita was with its cutscenes and mostly retaining that Uncharted feel despite not being at home on a console. Killzone Mercenary is a favorite of mine because literally everything you do in this game earns you money and you can use that money to kit out your character and play the game however you want. It was also downright gorgeous, one of the Vita's very best lookers, if not the best looking game on the system, and I couldn't suggest this one enough. However, these types of situations where the games are still available exclusively on the Vita are few and far between. Take one of my favorite personal franchises ever made, Danganronpa. I discovered this murder mystery series on Vita and fell in love. It made recommending the console beyond easy because it was that good. But much like a lot of games I'm going to list, it was ported to the PS4, thus taking away the value of owning a Vita. Well, at least there's zero escape. Oh, <laughs> I got this one, Gravity Rush. Damn it, Sony's persistent. Tearaway was an exclusive that took advantage of the Vita's underutilized tools, such as its camera and back touchpad. You could press on said back touchpad during certain segments of the game, and it would be as if your finger entered the game world. Look, I, I know it sounds weird, but it felt empowering, interactive, just hear me out. Sadly, this is another game that was ported to the PS4 under the title of Tearaway Unfolded. 
Admittedly, this is a situation where a lot of the charm was lost according to reviews because the experience through and through was designed for Vita and it feels best to play it there to this day. And there are many situations on the Vita where there are games available elsewhere, but it feels at home there. So as you can see, PlayStation did what any sensible business would do and made their games more accessible since the Vita didn't reach their expectations. However, it's not all doom and gloom. Vita still owns two very underrated Monster Hunter titles in Soul Sacrifice and Freedom Wars. My personal favorite of the two is Freedom Wars. Freedom Wars places you in a prison, having you volunteer to complete missions to whittle time off your overall sentence and earn your freedom. Soul Sacrifice is a little more edgy as you live the memories of another sorcerer through taking their journal and taking on all manner of creature. There's also Colin's personal favorite on the Vita, Persona 4 Golden. I know he's raved about this one, so I'll be brief. Persona 4 Golden still very much is Vita's best exclusive. You step into the shoes of you, Narukami, living your day-to-day -day life as a student, meaning you'll be going to class, hanging with friends, and working. Yes, I know. Isn't that great? On the other side of the spectrum, you're also a badass who can summon personas, and you're trying to solve the mysterious murders plaguing the town of Inaba. It's a little slow to start in the first couple of hours, but it's a top five game of all time for me, hands down. The charm of the characters, the wonderful story, excellent soundtrack, fun combat, it's all there. However, Atlas is now talking about the possibility of porting old Persona games, dating even back to the middle of last year, and even just recently in the month of February in 2020. They are not unaware of such a demand for the older Persona games. So suffice to say, given Persona's popularity, that the clock is ticking. The Vita is also able to play a lot of PSP games, but there's really strange omissions, such as one of the PSP's very best being Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core. While you're able to access a decent amount of the PSP's expansive library, stuff like this missing just makes you scratch your head. The Vita also owns a lot of great ports. The same could be said when you have that Nintendo Switch logic of buying old third-party games just for that portability factor. It applies here as well. Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Lost Dimension, Minecraft, Hotline Miami, the Metal Gear Solid HD Collection, Odin Sphere Liftraiser, and so on. All these ports are rock solid and great ways to experience the games. Sadly, due to the lack of a large consumer base, many companies didn't go out of their way to support this console. However, the Vita did thrive in Japan, and ultimately, I feel like if you do love JRPGs, then the Vita already is entirely worth owning. It has an extraordinarily vast selection of JRPGs, and many of them are good ones that'll soak up a ton of your time. The purchasing decision rests in your hands, but I think there's a lot of value to be found here. It's also a matter of how you prefer to play. In the situation of Zero Escape and Danganronpa, these are visual novel games. Quite frankly, I don't like to sit in my gaming chair hunched over my TV trying to read text. I'd rather lay in bed as if I were reading a book and play it on my Vita. It's a matter of personal preference and only you can answer that. Speaking of personal preference, also, you may have noticed on my Vita that I have attached to it a little plastic surrounding piece that is forming it into more of a controller. The original Vita felt incredibly uncomfortable in my hands until I put this sucker on there, so I highly highly recommend if you have bigger hands that this is something you get alongside your Vita. Do keep in mind if you are going to be investing that there are very few brand new games coming out to the PS Vita as Sony has announced they are no longer supporting this console. So when you buy it, you are investing in not its future, but its history. But I still think there's a ton of value here. If you're able to say sling $200 for a Vita, a charger, a 16 gigabyte memory card, and a couple of the games that I had listed here, then I say go for it. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Plus, there's still one big game set to launch on Vita. Twin Breaker.